left off the last one, we had just finished kind of going over the basics of those seismic waves, but we needed to go through the Earth's layers. Well, grab out page five of your reference tables and let's take a look at those different Earth layers. Spoiler alert, density, remember way back, like literally day one, remember that? Well, again, density is going to show up and be important again. There's a reason why I taught you it in the first unit. It's going to be everywhere and you got to understand it. So we look at the different earth layers and we use earthquake waves as a way to study those different earth layers. We can't dig down to them. It'd be impossible. We don't have the equipment. It's too hot. It's too dense. We just can't get there. So we have to use the data that we do have to figure it out. Seismic zones or shadow zones are a place on Earth's surface where earthquake waves don't go. Why? Which this goes to the whole Earth, right? Well, we have primary waves which can go through anything, and we have secondary waves which can't go through liquid. So remember what that liquid outer core and that plasticky liquid mantle, right? Well, the seismic S waves can't get through those things. And the primary waves, as they go through them, don't just go straight through them, they get refracted. So between getting refracted and bounced and bent and absorbed, these waves don't go straight across the earth. They go into these like curved patterns. Using that, we can figure out where an earthquake occurred when we triangulate all this stuff together. We take these different seismic readings and we have to have at least three different seismic stations to locate it. We have to have like one here and one here and one down here and they all kind of like, hey, I think it's right here. You get that point and there you go. That's probably where your earthquake happened. These can be spread out over miles and miles in different countries and all different countries have information all across the world to try to figure out what's going on in seismic zones, where tsunamis are going to happen, tsunami warnings, volcanic stuff. We have seismic data recording material everywhere to try to help everyone out and to stay as safe as we can. No one can do this alone. It's way too complicated and way too expensive to do that. But we do know that you need at least three different seismic stations to truly figure out where that earthquake is coming from. Now, looking at the maps on your notes, you'll see that the seismic station with the smallest circle is going to be the closest. It has the smallest radius that the earthquake probably happened in. And we know that the seismic station with the largest circle, the largest radius, is the one that's farthest away from it. It's also going to show a difference in P wave and S wave arrival. The one that's closest is going to have them with the least difference. The one that's farthest away is going to have them with the greatest difference. Now, again, this is the epicenter. This is not the focus. The focus is what happens under the ground where the earthquake really happens. We can't get to that, but we can find out where the epicenter is based on the maps and the um, recording data that we do have. Now, you might be going through and looking at all those slides that have a bunch of time on them and the little cards. I think I left them on there. Ignore that. That's way complicated. We're not even going to bother going through that. So what's up next? Volcanoes. Volcanoes are fun to see pictures of, fun to watch erupt, and maybe interesting to learn about, but you never really want to be in the way of one. All a volcano is, is a vent in the Earth's surface. So we talked about the mantle kind of constantly having this churning um, effect going on due to differences in density, those convection currents. And we said that sometimes the magma gets pushed up through the different rock layers. Well, if it gets pushed up far enough and it makes it through Earth's crust, it becomes a volcano. Now there's different types of volcanoes and we're going to get to those specifically and I'll let you write all those details down. I'm not going to say all of them in the video, but we know that they typically form near plate boundaries and different plate boundaries create different types of volcanoes. So the three main types of volcanoes are shield, strato, and cinder cone. And I'm not going to make you memorize every single one of these things. And I don't remember all of them because again, it's North Carolina. I didn't spend a lot of my geology days learning about volcanoes because there's not a lot here and I didn't really want to move to a place to go study volcanoes, though they are fascinating to learn about. Here's some basic notes that I want you to know. Shield volcanoes, not violent. You'll see them in Hawaii, places like that. They'll erupt. They'll have a lot of magma that comes out of them, but not violent. Stratovolcano, that's the ones you got to worry about. These are easily the most 
difficult to prepare or prepare for because they're the most violent ones. They are going to have those huge, big eruptions that you see um, posted on social media accounts or YouTube or on videos and things like that. These are the ones you probably think of when you think of volcanic eruptions. And the last one is cinder cone. It's kind of in the middle, obviously. And if I ask you to think of what a volcano looks like, this is probably going to be the one that you would imagine in your head. This is kind of the stereotypical volcano shape. So what do we need to worry about with a volcano? Well, obviously we need to worry about things catching on fire and burning, the ash, the magma, volcanic bombs, such as um, rocks that are getting shot out, they get flung up into the air and can break and destroy things when they land. Earthquakes happen with them, not because of the volcano, but it's a seismic zone. It's going to be related to each other. Tsunamis even. The next thing we're going to talk about, if a volcano happens underwater and a bunch of um, sediment moves, we're going to call that a mass movement. You're going to learn that in hydrosphere. Then it can trigger a tsunami. So now we have an earthquake, which has maybe helped move uh, magma around, which has caused a volcano, which has caused a tsunami. Once again, as you're starting to see, hopefully, in earth science, all these things are linking together. None of these things happen in a vacuum. And I haven't been saying that a lot this semester because I haven't really got to go into the depth of the material that I want to. But none of this stuff happens in a vacuum. It's all related somehow. It's up to us to figure out what that connection is. But it's not always a bad thing. You know, if you need to evacuate, the hazards are, you know, the volcano's happening, evacuate, cover your mouth, your nose, your eyes, those uh, little tiny pieces of rock are super hot and super sharp and they will cut you. And if you breathe them in, they'll cut the inside of your nose and your mouth and they get into your lungs and they can cut you there. It can cause abrasions and scratches on your skin. You can have all sorts of magma and lava around you that has created, you know, burning forest fires. There's also the pyroclastic flow, which is all the stuff rushing down the side of the mountain that goes way quicker than you think it does, hundreds of miles an hour. You're not outrunning it. Best thing to do with an erupting volcano is just not be near the erupting volcano. I mean, I know that sounds obvious, but that's kind of the best answer. It's just not be there. But volcanoes, as we talked about all semester, not everything is a con, everything has pros. What is it? Well, it can actually create some fertile soil to farm in and it can create new rocks and minerals to use as either materials to build with or to sell or to make roads and driveways and things like that. It can also, if you're near active volcanoes, be good sources of geothermal energy. So we're even getting some renewables in on this. But not everything is great and everything that has a, uh, a pro kinda always has a con with it as well. Now, in the U.S., we don't have a ton of active volcanoes, but the ones we do are mostly out west, mostly where those, unsurprisingly, geologic hotspots are for geothermal activity. So, coincidence? Probably not. Now, some of you might ask about the Yellowstone supervolcano, and is it going to eventually erupt? Yes, it's eventually going to erupt. Uh, is it going to be good? No, it's not going to be good. Is it something we should really spend our time worrying about? I wouldn't. Anyway, that's basically the end of volcanoes or what I'm going to go over with you for volcanoes. We're going to pick up the next one talking about hot spots and what that means. It's related to volcanoes, but it's a little bit different than that. And we'll go from there.